Well, good morning. This is a really exciting conference. It's, um, it's been a lot of work done on this over the last uh, year, uh, led by uh, Dr. Yusuf. And uh, as all of you know, we've gotten very busy in the aortic field. Um, I do have an announcement. Dr. Ryan told me there are three emergency cases that have just been added, so I hope that won't... Uh, no, I'm just joking. Don't worry. It's, it's okay. It's okay. So... Uh, <laughs> But uh, we're going to try to keep it light today, obviously, so we keep everybody here, um, and um, we'll uh, have, a, have a great session. This is, gonna, this is meant to be interactive, and uh, so I think most of us uh, know our presentations well enough so that uh, I'll leave it to each speaker, but you can, uh, you know, um, break in any time, ask questions, and feel free to do that. So let's see, do I operate these up here? This, yeah. So I just want to give an overview of the cardiac surgery program. Some of you have already heard this. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, over the last 11 years. So when we started uh, back in 2006, 2007, the program was at about 500, sort of heading downward. This, this curve sort of looked like this before that. And, uh, with the addition of uh, Drs. Lair, Dr. Youssef, uh, Dr. Ryan, and most recently uh, Dr. Hernandez, uh, we have continued to grow here. And uh, this is our cardiac surgery volume, so we're doing about 1,000 cases a year. This is a projected number, uh, as all of you in the room know, uh, that uh, November and December can get pretty nasty, so I suspect that this will probably not curve off here, but probably level off. And this is our TAVR volume right here. <clears throat> All TAVR programs have grown and uh, have continued to um, be a significant part of our program uh, in, in concert in conjunction with our cardiology colleagues. Uh, this is our volumes um, in the program uh, broken out. And you can see isolated AVR has, uh, has grown. We're still doing about 100, 118, 112. This is falling off a little bit, and it's because of the success of the TAVR program. There are a lot of patients that we were doing that uh, we probably shouldn't have been doing in the past, but now we're able to do. And you can see that, uh, that the TAVR numbers uh, have uh, continued to grow. Our, our structural heart program um, has also been very successful, and this is the MitraClip program. Uh, most recently, uh, we have um, uh, initiated uh, projects and programs in uh, um, um, uh, trans catheter mitral valve replacement and repairs, and so this will, these numbers will continue to grow, and of course this is done in, in conjunction with uh, our uh, colleagues in cardiology, doctors uh, Gafour and Jang, so, uh, and others, uh, the imaging uh, physicians, both in cardiology and radiology, that have made a huge impact on the success of these programs. We're very busy in the maze space. Um, we're doing uh, quite a number of um, maze operations, surgical ablation operations for atrial fibrillation. The vast majority, the majority of these are concomitant, although Dr. Lair has been doing uh, isolated um, uh, procedures um, and um, minimally invasive thoracoscopic procedures that have added to these numbers. Uh, the ECMO program, I don't have to tell anybody in this room that this has gotten very busy over the last several years. Um, and it's been a, a tremendous benefit to our patients. We're doing sicker patients, more complex patients, and this type of support is critical for the type of program that we have. Um, the aortic procedures that you can see here, this is um, harvested from calendar year uh, 2017. And so I think um, you can see that these numbers have continued to grow. Uh, Dr. Youssef joined us in 2013, right? And so these numbers have continued to pick up. Uh, these cases have gotten much more complex, a lot of arch work uh, that work and um, uh, TVAR work that uh, we're going to hear a lot about today. Uh, Dr. Lair has uh, championed the pulmonary embolectomy program, and this is just the open cases. There are a number of patients that are cared for by uh, uh, ECOS and, and uh, medical therapy, so this is a very comprehensive program here. Um, if we look at the aortic procedures, this is how it breaks out. So this is uh, harvested data from July 2017 to August 2018. You see we've done uh, 55 uh, aneurysm cases in that 12-month uh, period of time, been 37 dissections, um, been uh, cases associated with valvular dysfunction, so aortic root type procedures, um, aortic stenosis procedures, uh, infection. Uh, so a whole cavalcade of, of things. This, now I think this, these numbers add up to about 115 or so. 
Very busy program and continuing to grow. Uh, and getting back to our general uh, cardiac surgery program, this is our uh, operative mortality risk adjusted all STS cases by year. Uh, it was honestly pretty nasty back in 2006, 2007, not numbers that we want to see. But <clears throat> we have all worked very hard together and, and because of the work that uh, the patients are seen and comprehensively managed in the office by our office staff and by and in the OR because of, uh, of everybody's involvement and engagement in the operating room. These uh, green bars are uh, green because of all the work that everybody does. And our current um, operative uh, O to E ratio is 0 0.561 being what the expected uh, and observed outcomes are. And so we're, that number means that we're 44% better than what we uh, one would anticipate. This is our isolated AVR by year, and uh, we've had one death uh, in the, since uh, 2012, so there's been one death out of 655 cases with isolated AVR uh, since February 2012. And again, this is, a, um, this is a result of the combined efforts of our cardiology program um, and our um, uh, TAVR program, picking and choosing the correct, uh, uh, the correct patients. Uh, there's a painful conference that occurs every Tuesday morning that I don't have to tell a lot of the people in this room about, but this is, this is, what, this is uh, the result of that uh, conference and, and making sure that every patient gets the right procedure at the correct time. So that's sort of internal data. So if we look at ourselves in the, uh, in the COPE, uh, which is a clinical, clini uh, Washington Clinical Outcomes Assessment Program, this is a, uh, a voluntary participatory program that, um, that all, I think it's 17 cardiac surgery programs in the state participate in. This was actually started by our own Mary Gregg, who was a cardiac surgeon who worked here for a number of years, and then uh, Mary championed this program and was really a, an integral part of it. Um, so it's a statewide quality comparison of cardiac surgery programs. There are 14 hospitals participating, and uh, the data submission is really dependent upon uh, the, the individual hospitals to submit that data. And so if we just look at volumes, uh, this only includes cabbage isolated valves and cabbage valves. So if you do a, a, a cabbage uh, maze or uh, aortic uh, ascending aorta or something like that that gets kicked out of this, but you can see that we're the largest program in the state. Uh, a lot of very good programs in here, but, um, but our volumes uh, continue to be quite good. I'm very uh, pleased with this is that uh, recently COPE, and this is all publicly reported data, uh, COPE uh, started sending out um, <clears throat> outlier notifications. This is a this is a good time to be an outlier. We were uh, this is a positive outlier, meaning that um, for uh, for stroke in cabbage, uh, we were statistically significantly better. Our mortality in valves, we were statistically significantly better, and our mortality in cabbage plus valves, we were uh, really had a none uh, in that in that time period. So, we overall uh, this is I think just a uh, surrogate marker for how uh, well our program works. Oh yeah, what? How much time do I have? Okay. <laughs> um, so we are. Um, um, this is a, a just a, again a little bit broader net. So we're also part of everybody knows we're part of Providence in the uh, Swedish system-wide cardiac surgery um, uh, report system, and there are 16 programs in the Providence system covering about uh, seven states now. And so this is data that is uh, presented by them. And you can see this is the type of data that we are now seeing. Um, again, we're the largest program actually within the Providence system. Um, and this is the type of reports that we are seeing. These, these, this is a good thing. This is called a QSUM um, analysis. Uh, and I'm not going to say any more about it because I've just told you everything I know about it because it's a very highly analytical, complex uh, um, arithmetical expression, but what you want is this line to be going down below this line here, it continuing to be pushed down, so we are continuing to improve. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, and to drill down even further, to, to talk about the type of uh, analysis that's being done in today's world and going forward, this is a, a cardiac surgery master uh, surgeon report, um, and so within Providence, we are now seeing um, not only volumes, but outcomes. Um, and so this is the report that you can see from every center for all cardiac surgery programs within Providence. And um, as I said on last Thursday, and I'll repeat, it's, it's a no surprise to anybody, Dr. Lair is the busiest surgeon within Providence of all 35 surgeons that are here. Uh, and uh, all four of us are, um, 
are the busiest surgeons within Providence. So I'll let you take a moment to soak that in, Dr. Larry. <laughs> So, um, so just again, real quick on this, um, I presented this last Thursday, and I think it's really important for us to understand where we are, where we're going. Uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s, as I reflect back on 32 years of cardiac surgery practice, uh, the focus was on high volume, who was the surgeons, who was the busiest surgeon, so forth and so on, who was the largest center. Uh, really, you didn't really know anything, honestly, about quality in the 80s and 90s. Um, and the other important points to take away from that time period was that uh, the cost of care and the cost of innovation was not an issue. I mean, there was money laying all over tables, uh, on the floor, you know, you could do whatever you wanted to do. And, uh, oh, sure, you want another, you know, $100,000 this, a million dollar that, go ahead and buy it. Uh, that's, this is no longer the case. Um, in the 1990s and 2000s, there was an increasing focus on quality. Uh, this is the Northern New England uh, Cardiothoracic Surgery Study Group that started this initiative really in 1987. STS started reporting in 1989 or, or started voluntarily uh, uh, collecting data in 1989. Of course, this has become really the, ro the most robust registry uh, known to uh, procedural care really in the country. And COPE, uh, which I've already talked about, started in 1996. VISICU, which is Virginia Cardiac Surgery Quality Initiative, which was started by one of my partners in my group, was uh, started in 1996. And then the Michigan, Dr. Prager, who has done a tr remarkable amount of work where the POPMA analysis has originated, which has made a huge impact on how we think about um, uh, our, our quality of care. POPMA stands for post-operative uh, mortality, uh, phase of mortality care. and so. Uh, we, we use this format in our um, M&Ms, as, as you all have seen, to make sure that um, we are identifying where the points are that um, errors occurred and where we can improve. So, but where are we now and where are we headed? Well, so today and the future really is this sentence. What is the value proposition of any program? What is the value proposition of our program, right? And this really is the next big thing. So um, the future of healthcare, and not really the future, the future is here now. Th this is what it's all about right here. It doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, it has to do with quality, obviously. It has to do with the, qual uh, the price and the cost. So that's the value. And it's like I said last, went, last Thursday, uh, you know, we all go to Walmart, we all go to Target. This is exactly what I want. It provides me uh, exactly the quality that I want. I guess I'm over. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to stop this, <laughs> but this this is what we'll um, just give me a couple more minutes. I'll, I'll take Chief's prerogative here. <laughs> um, so this is the um, this is really where we're headed: is to make sure that we can identify the uh, the value. So uh, this is something that now uh, Providence, the healthcare system, is looking at. It's really a fascinating model because it is really exciting to me because you have these three elements, the cost, the patient experience, and the outcomes. And this gives you what they're now terming the value-oriented architecture. They started this in orthopedics, and now they're applying it to cardiac surgery. And so if you look at this, uh, the value plot is uh, lower cost and higher quality. Um, lower cost here, higher quality here. This is the ideal state you want to be in, low cost, high quality. So for every program now, they are looking at this, and this is just uh, one example. They're beginning to, just beginning in cardiac surgery. They're looking at uh, elective uh, uh, cabbage surgery, less than 2% STS mortality, uh, predicted mortality. And so what you want to do is to be in this box. We are right there, that's our star right there, and the, the size of the, uh, the circles are how big volume, how, uh, what the volumes are for these programs. But this really is what uh, what the future is all about. And so as we go forward, whether it's uh, TAVR, aortic valve replacement, mitral valve repair, aortic work, we're going to be judged by this as we should be, uh, because we're talking about patient care and the importance. Uh, you, you can't get any more important than that. So, with that, I'll stop. <laughs>